Well, thanks everybody for, uh, for attending and uh, for listening to this talk. Uh, my name is Ralph Castain. A lot of the work I'm going to describe today was uh, done in collaboration with my partner here, Wang Da Tan. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the MR Plus system uh, and give a little bit of an overview of how we might use it in the future. So uh, first, what is MR Plus? Uh, the MR Plus system is a port of the Hadoop map reduce code. Uh, to the general computing environment. For those who aren't entirely familiar with MapReduce, MapReduce runs on uh, dedicated hardware at this point in time. So if you want to set up a uh, Hadoop cluster uh, or run MapReduce programs, you have to set up a, a dedicated piece of hardware that runs Hadoop. And, uh, and it really can't run much uh, else. And so what we wanted to do was to actually be able to move that off from a dedicated hardware, remove that requirement, and allow these programs to run anywhere uh, using any resource manager, but with a stipulation that there be no change to a user level program. So a user has to be able to execute this without changing their program, uh, but run it simply somewhere else. The, uh, if we could do that, then we would say, well, what we can do then is we can leverage a lot of other things. Uh, for example, high performance computing world has done a lot of work on creating libraries for various computational and uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, but those are all MPI based and you have to be able to run in an MPI like environment in order to do that. They've also done a lot of work on fault recovery and, and uh, highly efficient and, and fast messaging systems um, which we could exploit if we could run in a general computing environment. And we also then, though, have to be able to coexist. Uh, so like I said, no dedicated cluster required, but that means that you have to share. So certain requirements came out of that, uh, which we're going to deal with here in a bit. But first, you know, what, what it is not. Uh, we went through a lot of effort to make sure that we did not rewrite Hadoop. Uh, we wanted to change the absolute minimum number of changes required. And all those changes had to be down at a low level that are away from the user code, because we don't want any change in the user's application in order to use it. So, so the code was deliberately um, designed that way then to be hidden from the user. And it, we really want to push that back upstream at some point. This is not an attempt to undermine the Hadoop community. We're not trying to replace the Apache efforts. What we want to be able to do is show that we can take the Apache code, make it more generally usable, and then be able to contribute that back into the system. So some of the things that motivated the work, uh, if you've worked with Hadoop, uh, the yarn distribution of Hadoop, you know some of these issues already. But there are issues with scalability. Uh, Hadoop has a very, uh, and I'll go through in some more detail here how it launches processes, but it does it in a very linear fashion. So if you're going to launch this across a very large cluster like thousands of processes or tens of thousands of processes, the time it takes to do that scales linearly. Uh, it doesn't have any real uh, inherent wire up capability for things like MPI because the standard Hadoop model is of course non-communicating independent processes. So uh, the only way to wire up is for everybody to phone home and then for that main process to send the interconnected information back out to everybody. But it can only do that in a linear fashion because there's no communication between nodes. And we'll go over that in more detail later. So as a result, what happens is that you actually have a wire up uh, time that scales quadratically, uh, which is very um, uh, opposite of what the MPI world, the high performance computing world is used to. They're used to seeing a much faster, much more uh, scalable kind of approach to wire up. Um, data in, in Apache Hadoop is transferred over HTTP. Uh, there is no real uh, you know, socket to socket like messaging system. And so uh, that has its performance issues. And like I say, when you have to have a dedicated system that has its own resource manager in it, that's a barrier to people uh, in terms of adopting it. Because if you're an IT department, for example, you're trying to support 
something like this. Well, now you've got another resource manager you have to you have to train on and support for people, another cluster you have to set up, et cetera. That's, that's an issue for people to deal with. So if we look at, at what, it, what constitutes these problems, where do they come from and how do you get around it? Uh, there's two variants of Hadoop out there. There's 1.0 and 2.0, uh, and they are a little bit different. So in Hadoop 1.0, a client uh, program attaches generally to a job tracker. The job tracker is responsible for basically the resource management function, if you will. And the job tracker is listening to heartbeats from a task tracker that's sitting on each node. And the task tracker actually is responsible for launching and managing these individual processes that are out there. And that information about these, these guys, the task trackers, are connected back to the job tracker via heartbeat that runs uh, periodically. But the one key point here is that this job tracker does not retain any global state information. So it doesn't retain knowledge of who's running where or what the state of the node is. It relies on the heartbeat to tell it what that state is and to keep refreshing it. So when a job tracker gets a client request saying, I want to run something, what it does is it says, OK, that's interesting. I'm going to wait here and hold that request while I wait for, for the task tracker heartbeats to come back and tell me what resources they have available to them. So every time a heartbeat comes back, it not only tells the job tracker that node is still alive, it also tells the, the job tracker, I, I have one task running on me. I've got an empty slot here where I could run somebody else if you have somebody that wants to run. So when somebody says I want to run something, the job tracker has to wait until these heartbeats come back saying I have a slot available and then look at that node and see if that node is an appropriate one to run on and if it has a resource available, then it can go ahead and say fine, go ahead and run that process for me. So as a result, it takes quite a bit of time to raster your way through and find where you can run processes. And so since there's a, a task assignment only done on heartbeat, that means the job tracker, like I said, has to wait. The job tracker was, uses a synchronous processing of the heartbeats. So there's a, the interior uh, handling of heartbeats in Hadoop 1.0 is handled in a way that happens to maximize the transaction rate of something about 200 beats a second. So if you have 200 nodes, it takes a full second to cycle across all the heartbeats from them. If you have 1,000 nodes, you've got to leave five seconds to get across all the, all, the, the, uh, all the heartbeats. So since there's no global status information, I can only assign tasks when I get a beat, and that means it's a linear launch scaling. There's no inter-node communication. If you may have noticed in my diagram there, there was no communication from one task manager to another task manager. So what that means is I've got a hub and spoke topology for communications. So if I want to wire up and say, hey, here's my endpoint information, here's the socket I'm listening to, the only method I have of doing that is to send it back to the home process and have them send it back out to everybody else. There's no way I can use a collective-like operation in order to spread the information. On the plus side, it's a very simple fault recovery model. Everything's independent. It's a nice linear connection. I know when somebody fails and I know what, lost, what was lost. It's easy for me to wire it back up. If I look at Hadoop 2.0, uh, when that transition was made, they basically took the job tracker and the whole resource management system and split it apart into different ways. And so then there was, a, instead of a task tracker, there's a node manager. And instead of a job tracker, there's a resource manager that's sitting there um, that does a few other different things. But one of the biggest things really was they changed the processing of the heartbeats into an asynchronous process so they can get a bit more throughput in there. So they're not, no longer limited to the 200 beats per second, which helps. So it now looks like this. Um, I have a, a resource manager sitting out here. Again, he does not retain any global state information. So he relies on the data coming back in the heartbeats to tell him how, much, how many resources are available. Instead of a task tracker, I have a node manager. 
but you'll notice that the node manager no longer has a connection to the process. The node manager doesn't start the local process anymore in a parent-child relationship. Well, instead, I have an application master. So what happens now is when a client says, I want to run a job, he contacts the, the resource manager and says, I want to run something. I need to start an application master who's going to run my application. The resource manager waits for heartbeats to come back to find a single container that can run the application master. He then launches the application master on that node. The application master then has to, is, the, is the thing that's actually going to run your job. So it's a two-stage launch we're talking about. So the application master is the one that's going to actually run the job for you. What it does is it then calls back and asks the resource manager for the resources it's going to require to actually run your job, including any preferred locations. In case you want to co-locate a process to a file, for example, this thing will pass that information back to the resource manager and say, I need resources that match this description. The resource manager will then pass that information back to the application master, telling him, well, here are the places that you can run your application. And the application then goes ahead and launches those processes on those nodes. Notice that the application master, as far as this process is concerned that got started, the application master is the only point of contact that he really knows. And so all connection information has to go back to the application master, and the application master then has to circulate it out. So just like with Hadoop 1.0, we still have a hub and spoke arrangement going on, but the hub is now the application master instead of the client program. So if we look at Hadoop 2.0, what we've gone to now is we have a two-stage launch. Um, so it's true that we can do task assignment faster than we did before, but now we have to do it twice. Once for the application master, which is a single slot, but then the second time for the actual application itself, which could be a lot of slots. We still don't have any global status info, so we still have to wait for a beat to assign a, the, both the application master and the tasks to where they're going to run. And since we're doing, looking at it from a heartbeat standpoint, we still have linear launch scaling. We still don't have inter, internode communication, so we're still stuck with hub and spoke. Uh, we still do have that simple fault recovery model. Uh, because I can still see that direct, uh, with any hub and spoke arrangement, right? You have the direct connection, so you know when something's failed. You do have a little bit of a security concern um, that doesn't appear to, uh, to concern the Hadoop community too much, but from the HPC world, uh, we've run into a number of times, and that is that uh, system administrators don't like heavyweight daemons. That node manager daemon does a lot of stuff, and so it's actually a fairly large amount of code sitting up there in that node manager. Uh, in most secure systems, for example, that would be an issue because he's running at a, at a privileged level. Uh, so we generally don't like to see privileged level daemons that have some he heavy weight to them that have lots of code in them because that creates opportunities for, uh, for hacking. So, uh, so that's one issue is, is these heavyweight daemons uh, are a little bit of a concern. So uh, just some observations of what all that means. Um, ran a few little speed tests just to see what it would be like. Um, if I run, if I use the MR plus-like architecture, basically uh, the open MPI architecture for launching something, and I'm running on, a sl on Slurm, for example, I can start about 16,000 processes on 1,000 nodes, and I can have it launched in about 20 milliseconds. It's wired and running in about 10 seconds uh, total time. On a, a Cray at Los Alamos, uh, we relaunched 139,000 processes and 8,500 nodes. The launch time took about one second, and the whole thing was wired up and running in about 60 seconds, about a minute. Same thing with Hadoop. I ran, if you run two processes on separate nodes, it can take about five seconds to run. Almost all of it's spent waiting for heartbeats. Uh, 
depends on what the heartbeat time is on this, obviously, because you can tune that down. But if you take a bigger job and you try and run this, this is again done at Los Alamos, it took it almost 10 minutes just to launch the processes, and it was, took about 45 minutes to do the wire up, just because of the quadratic scaling on the wire up. So it takes a long, long time. Now in fairness, people don't generally run Hadoop processes of that, uh, jobs of that size. But it just gives you an idea of the kind of scaling laws that you might see and the, the issues that one has when looking at this from the perspective of a high performance computing world. When you see those kind of numbers, that's, that's a little disturbing. So the MR plus approach basically was to say, let's take out the Hadoop resource managers uh, which are the source of, the, uh, of that bottleneck. And let's replace them with something else. And what we'll do is we'll say, let's, we already have a resource manager on the system, be it, be it, uh, be it Slurm or be it uh, uh, Moab or Torque or whatever it is, or, or Cray's Alps system. We already have a resource manager on the system. Uh, so let's just use that resource manager because this resource manager knows how to launch scalably and knows how to launch very fast. So we're just going to use him as he currently sits. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a, an abstraction layer underneath this Hadoop client that, acts, that makes the Hadoop client see the yarn uh, job or, or the yarn resource manager that it's expecting to see, but instead we'll translate that into code that talks to this guy. So from the perspective of the Hadoop application, nothing has changed. He sees a world that's, that's all Hadoop, but the outside world sees a world that's all non-Hadoop. Okay. Quick question, which, uh, for instance, batch schedulers have you actually written this kind of shim layer for yet? The question was, what, uh, what, what schedulers, what backend resource managers have we written this shim layer for? Uh, as I'm going to show you here in a minute, the, the shim layer was written with OpenMPI's runtime, Orte. And Orte has already got shims to all the major uh, runtime envi environments. So basically, by making that one shim using that particular plugin arrangement, we gained access to all the resource managers that are out there today. So what are the differences? And, and what, what's the advantage of using the system resource manager? Well, high performance computing world's resource managers uh, are constructed quite differently from the Hadoop resource manager. For one thing, they maintain system state. Uh, so they, re they don't rely on heartbeats. Uh, they may, some of them use heartbeats to detect node failure, but they don't rely on heartbeats to do launches and allocations and scheduling. So, um, they may use multi, uh, connection states. They may form a, a, a reliable, kind of like a TCP connection between the, with their node managers, if you will, so they can know whether or not the node dies by looking at the connection. They might use a heartbeat. There's still a few that do. But either way, um, they don't use the heartbeat for, uh, for scheduling purposes. Uh, they Instead, they deal with availability in a different way. Instead of worrying about heartbeats, they basically have redundant masters and they use a multi-path connection topology, and I'll show a little bit of that later, to, uh, to deal with the potential, uh, to, to limit the number of connections that are out there. So in other words, the master node might have a connection to say eight nodes out there, and then those eight nodes fan out to another eight nodes each in order to get the connectivity you want without having too many connections on the master node. If somebody fails in the middle, there's a secondary path to come back to tell you that that guy failed and that guy's dropped out of the network. And you have to have another way of communicating to nodes that are beyond it. So what that does, it allows for scalable launch. Uh, most of these resource managers will launch on a logarithmic scaling pattern. Uh, so you know, if you double the number of nodes, you don't double the length of time it takes to launch. It goes up by about the log of two. Um, they also all have uh, MPI support built into them. 
And so the sharing of connection information also occurs through this collective operation. And so I can wire up in a log n scaling law. And they uh, have all been designed around this security concerns that have been raised over the years about maintaining uh, very lightweight daemons out there. Um, the general rule of thumb on these systems is that the only thing that that daemon does, that root level daemon does, is fork exec. There's no connect com communication capability uh, between it and the user application. There's, uh, there's no uh, resource management capabilities built into it. Nothing like that's in there. All this thing basically can do is take a command saying fork this and make this user be the person, uh, be the, uh, the uh, make it run under this user ID. And that's it. And so therefore it's very minimal risk. Uh, now the, the daemons that come out of Orte that are, and remember we're using Orte actually to replace that resource manager. Or, or replace the connection to the resource manager. Uh, the daemons in Orte are heavier than that. The things that actually will launch the processes are actually heavier than that. Uh, they don't fit that security model, but they only operate at user level. And so therefore the system is happy with that. That's also the one reason why we never use an Orte at the system level as a system daemon. So how did we do it? Okay, well first thing it is we overlaid the Hadoop job client class using a JNI integration uh, module that talks to Orte, or uses Orte commands. So this allows Orte to basically serve as the shim between the client, the Hadoop client, which is thinking that it sees a Hadoop world underneath it, and Orte, which then uses its abstraction layer to talk to the resource manager. So by doing that, we actually can use the, the Orte systems for launching and monitoring and wiring up the processes. And we already know from, the, from studying it or developing it for the high performance computing world that it scales at a login rate. So that helps. Um, we get the MPI support because that's what Orte is there to do. It knows how to wire up MPI processes. And then we had to add one other thing to it, and that was that MapReduce, of course, runs mappers, and then it runs reducers, and it might do that multiple times through multiple stages. And that's not a typical high-performance computing programming paradigm. MPI jobs don't do that. Um, and so we had to add the ability to do a staged execution. Um, fortunately, Orte is built on a state machine, so Implementing that was nothing more than creating a, a different variation of the state machine to, uh, to run the jobs. So, um, so that was fairly straightforward. And then the other thing we had to do was um, uh, Hadoop, of course, assumes that you're going to preposition files. Right? There's no network file system in Hadoop. So you're going to move your files to wherever they need to be. Your executable, whatever support your executable needs, has to be moved from the client's node where the client is running to whatever node you're going to execute on. Uh, in the MPI world, that again, that's not, that's not typical. You don't usually see that. Usually there's a network file system and all the files are located on that. Uh, that's a, but, but that's how the Hadoop clusters are set up. So to support that, we created the ability to pre-position the files. But again, what we did is we piggybacked it on that launch system that we have already in the system so that we could actually move those files out in a login fashion. So in the Hadoop world, when you want to launch a process, the, the resource manager takes your files and shoves them up to each node in a linear fashion again. Now, it may multi-thread or whatever, but it's still a linear process of moving your files to the various nodes where they need to go and then it executes your process there. In this case, what we do is we use this, this same launch system, so we get the launch scaling at login by using the exact same mechanism, we actually can position the files as login. The second thing we had to do was we had to extend the, the Hadoop file system class because we didn't want to use HTTP to move data across for processes to communicate with each other. Um, in a general purpose computing, a high performance computing world, you don't run Apache web server on all your nodes. Okay, uh, they just, you know, we just don't do things like that. 
Um, and so you needed a different way of moving data around. So we created an alternative approach that, uses, that provides all the same interfaces, but we basically use it by uh, a message-based method for moving the files across. So, so yes. a question about this, the last bullet. So is this uh, a layer within ORD, or are you using the parts that actually won't be there for the InfiniBand? Or do you not really have InfiniBand support yet for moving the file, the intermediate files? Uh, the question was, I'm repeating the question for the, for the video, but uh, the question was on this last bullet, um, what interconnects are we actually supporting at this point in time, and are we, are we doing it through ORTE or doing it with, through an MPI communication? Is that, a, is that a, yes. Uh, the answer is at the moment we don't support InfiniBand and UDP because we're doing it over the ORTE interface. Okay. Um, the plan for Open MPI is over the next few months we're going to move the byte transfer layer uh, in Open MPI out of the MPI layer and down underneath the runtime layer. And then the runtime layer then will drive it across those, those transports. So the bullet here is we move BTL into, into a package that Orti can access. Yes, yes, yes. We are going to move, and you'll see this a little later, I'll, I'm gonna, I highlight it, we're going to move the Open MPI, uh, MPI uh, byte trans, uh, transports out of the MPI layer and down into a layer where the runtime can access them. And then we will be able to drive it faster. So if you have already ridden a BTL to like a different uh, high performance interconnect, then that would get pulled along with this Yes, any, any, any interface that was already there for the, will be pulled along and brought down and be able to operate across this. So what are the biggest differences then? Um, Part of it's in the daemons. Uh, the daemons uh, in Hadoop don't communicate with each other. They, they send heartbeats back to the central uh, resource manager. Um, they don't know anything about what's going on in the other nodes. And so you have these, these kind of uh, behaviors. But the positive thing is it's relatively easy fault tolerance. Uh, in the HPC world, our daemons, the Orte daemons, we wire up into a communication fabric upon launch. So we have inter-node communication. We can, excuse me, we can relay messages so we can get a login kind of communication pattern, a collective communication pattern going. Um, each Orte has an independent snapshot of the system so they know where all the other processes are. They know how to send a message from one place to another at any given time. And as a result, we get the kind of behavior we're used to seeing in the high performance computing world in terms of login scaling laws, but we have a more complex fault tolerance design. And that has been addressed over the years to try and find ways to solve that. So uh, the other big area of differences is in the resource manager itself. So in Hadoop, the resource manager doesn't retain the global state information, so therefore it it is reliant upon the heartbeats, and therefore it's got the behaviors that we were talking about before, but it's easy to recover from a failure. The high performance world, the resource managers maintain a global state so they can automatic, immediately allocate and optimize the assignment of resources because they have a global picture, so their allocation time is very, very fast, but it's more difficult to recover when that resource manager has failed. However, in compensation for that, the difference really is that in the high performance world, we've spent a couple of decades now dealing with how to make resource managers fault tolerant. And so, uh, have we solved the problem completely? No, it's, not, it's a non-trivial problem, but the fact is that we do have methods in place that help make that a less of an issue. So there are three new pieces then that get introduced into the Hadoop world in order to make this work. Uh, there's a, there are three Gini modules out there. Uh, there's a job client.c, which basically looks like, uh, takes the, uh, lets the, the uh, uh, Hadoop job look at the world as though it was a Hadoop resource manager out there while at the same time we shim across and, and let the rest of the world see uh, Orte instead. 
And this basically works as the head node process in an Orte system. So it's the, the equivalent of MPI run in the MPI world. And so this, this process then becomes, the, or this Gini module basically is responsible for translating all the job requests in Hadoop into basic things that look like uh, the equivalent of an MPI job, and then executing them. And then there's a file system.c, which basically handles all those file things we talked about, the open, close, read, and write, where we basically are wind up using the Orte daemons to move data around between the mappers and reducers in the shuffle stage of Hadoop. And then there's a mapred.c uh, file, a Gini module, that sits actually under the mappers and reducers themselves. Basically, well, that's there because we have to, the mappers and the reducers have to exchange metadata that tell them you know, tell the reducers, the mappers need to tell the reducers where, the, where their files are, where their data is. And so this is what facilitates that exchange. So if we walk through one of these jobs, basically, uh, what we do is we say, let's, let's get a new job client. We want to run a map reduce job. So we get a new job client. Uh, we load the open MPI libraries and initialize the Orte system. Uh, and we create a MapReduce pair uh, instance, something we're going to track in the, uh, in the high-performance computing world as a job, but we're going to track these two jobs as an entity. Uh, the job client goes ahead and adds mappers and adds reducers. They do it as many times as they like, so they can have as many mappers as they want or as many reducers as they want. Each time we save that as a separate command line, so they can put anything on the command line they want. Uh, we add the files and any jars that are required in order to help support them since it's all in, it, the application program is going to be in Java, so therefore there are jars involved. And then we run the job. And basically at that point, Orte goes off, talks to the resource manager, and says, I need these, ma these many resources, gets them allocated, and executes it. Currently, we only allow you to run one map reduce pair at a time. You can, you can go ahead and, um, and define as many as you want, but we only run one map reduce pair at a time. Uh, in the future, you can sequence them any way you want, but in the future, we are going to allow you to run multiple ones in parallel. Uh, there's a little bit of trickery we have to do in order to make that work, but uh, we know how to do it, it just hasn't been done. When you look at resources that you want to use, in, an, in, the, in the current HPC world, what we normally do is we go ahead and, and, uh, and a user will get an allocation in advance, saying, I want so many nodes or, or so many uh, uh, CPUs to execute on. Uh, and then they execute their job. So at the beginning of the time when MPI run gets executed or whatever, it gets executed, we know what resources belong to us and that we can use. Um, that's not how Hadoop works. In the Hadoop world, the user wants to run their, their Hadoop program and the program actually figures out how many nodes it's going to need, how many mappers it's going to want to run, that kind of, that kind of thing. And so you have to be able then to pick up the allocation on the fly while the, while the client program is running. So, uh, so what you want to do, uh, so what we do is we, we provide a mechanism uh, where the Java layer can go ahead and figure out what location preferences it's going to have. Um, the, again, the Hadoop wants to run where the data is. So, you want to be able to take the Hadoop process and say, I want to put it on that node because that node has a file out on it that, it that it wants to read. The only way for us to determine that is to let the Java side, the Hadoop side, figure that out because it's got to talk to the HDFS file system and be able to get that information. We don't have a good, clean way of getting that info, so we let the Java side get it and then pass that down to us. It basically comes down to us as a non-binding hint. So, what that tells us is, I'd like to run on that node, but if I can't run on that node, at least get me somewhere close, if you can. So, uh, these kind of capabilities have been built in. 
so we can be able to take these kind of location preferences in. Um, we don't currently do that, right, because we, we currently don't have that, that interface into the resource manager to tell the resource manager what these hints mean. And so at the moment, we still require that you go ahead and get the um, allocation in advance. Uh, we are working on a, an extension to the resource managers that will let us go ahead and pass it the, uh, the hint and have it be, give us an allocation based on that. Uh, and we have a prototype of it, but it's not currently in the code base. So some constraints. Uh, if you're going to run Hadoop somewhere, you have to have obviously run it somewhere. Because it's running on nodes that are not necessarily owned by it, uh, remember this is a, this is a, a non-owned, uh, it's a shared node environment in a Hadoop world. You have to have some place where you can execute it. You're, there's no network file system necessarily mounted, so there's no home directory you can send the user to, like we typically do. So you have to run it somewhere. The uh, Orte automatically defines a temporary session directory. This is a directory in the temporary file system where the user can safely go ahead and write temporary files in and out without worrying about clobbering something. So. What we do is we launch your, your uh, mapper process or your reducer process in that session directory. That's your current working directory. And so any files that you preload, any jars that your program needs in order to run, any source, any data files it needs to be able to read, are all moved to that location. So that they are all relative location, uh, they can all be accessed in a relative location to you. We also take any jars that you ask us to move, and we automatically add those to your class path in your environment. So, so everything you need should be there, and the environment should be set. The only thing we require is that you must have Hadoop in your path on all the nodes, and that OMPI must be installed and in the path and library path on all the nodes. That's a typical high-performance computing requirement that's out there. Um, but we do require that as well. So for in terms of executing, for each pair of mapper and reducer jobs that were defined, we run all the mappers first. So we start with, uh, we give priority to the longest running mappers. Basically, when you define a mapper and tell me, uh, here's a mapper I want to run as part of this job, you give me a priority number, which somehow, hopefully, relates to your expected length that that, that mapper is going to run. It might be the, the, how big the data file is or something. It doesn't matter what the number is. I'm only looking at the relative number itself. But if it's a larger number, um, then I say, well, then that's a, that's a slower job. Uh, okay, so therefore it can go. It, it should go first. It's a longer running job, so it's kind of an inverted thing. But the higher that number is, that tells me that that's the higher the priority should be for that job. Um, you give me location hints. Uh, so if I look at the resources, if you say I want this process, this mapper should run on node foo. Um, if node foo is in the, in the resource allocation, then I will map that process to node foo. If node foo is not in the resource allocation, then I'm going to put it anywhere at that point. So, um, so the hint I use to prioritize the resources, there is an option on the hint that we implemented that it says if you say I only want this mapper to run on node foo, you can set that flag for me, and I'll know that I can only run it on node foo. Uh, so then if node foo is not in the allocation, you'll get an error saying I can't run that, pro that job. If it is in there, but it's busy, then I'll reschedule this mapper to run later, OK? Because that, that resource isn't available. Whereas if the strict is not set, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it on a different resource that is available. So when all the mappers are fully completed, we then go ahead and just run the associated reducer. 
and the reducer can have hints just like the mappers about where you want them to run. Now there's a lot of different ways to handle that priority as to who gets to run first. Uh, these are ones we've, we've been looking at, all the different ways one could do it. Uh, right now, eldest, the priority, the, well actually uh, the one we wrote right now is greedy. So greedy means that the longest running time, uh, the highest priority number that you gave me in the mappers or the reducers, that's the priority that gets to run first. But there are others that can be implemented as well uh, by simply changing those algorithms. And there are lots of different options available. Once the mapper is done, the reducer has to access the mapper's data. And like I said before, we, we're going to do that via extensions to the file system class. And basically what those do is they, they say, instead of the, the process itself moving the data, we're going to let the daemons help us out here to move the data across the system. So, so what we're going to do is that when a process says, I need to access uh, a certain set of bytes in a file that's on some other node, we let the daemon go ahead and get those bytes for us and bring it across. And so we're not sitting there waiting on it ourselves. So it's done in a non-blocking point-to-point -point method. Um, at some point, when we get the OMPI transports in, in moved down, and so the MPI transports are available to us, we'll be able to actually stripe that data across multiple transports. But at the moment, it's a single point-to-point -point, uh, transport method. We also do have streaming mode. I just uh, going back to that. So let's say the uh, intermediate files were actually just on the uh, on, uh, you know, DRAM file system, not backed by devices, or the sections that were being needed out of the different intermediate files were, were such that you could, for instance, in-map in that file region. The daemon could in-map in the file region and register, like with the uh, with the IB NIC and then just set up a DMA transfer directly, would you, do you think that's something that conceivably could be part of this uh, framework once you get the BTL down? Yes. The, okay. Yeah, the question was, uh, rather than using point-to-point -point communications and writing things into files and, and, and reading files and everything, um, could you, uh, in a future implementation, be able to uh, Say you have a, a, a machine that doesn't have files or disk, hard disk storage on the nodes. Can I store the data in, in a registered memory area, for example, and then just DMA it across uh, the transports? Uh, especially because uh, the MPI transports already support DMA transfers, et cetera, and memory map transfers. Uh, can you take advantage of that? And the answer is yeah, and we'll, we will definitely do that. But that kind of gets down to, to this mode here and that is the streaming mode. In the streaming mode, uh, if, if I take away the requirement that you execute at the same time, so I'm gonna do some kind of a buffering perhaps, um, uh, or I allow streaming at the same time, I, I can move the data directly from a mapper to a reducer. Remember, like I said before, the Orte daemon knows where everything's running. So, and so do the, uh, uh, the processes themselves are given that information at time of startup. So if I know that all the mappers and reducers are alive, or if I know that the reducer I'm trying to give data to is alive, there's no reason to write it necessarily to a file. I could write it directly, send it directly to that daemon, or to that reducer, and let him go ahead and absorb it. So there's lots of these kind of improvements that could be done. But the operating principle of Hadoop in terms of the way it was originally written was the idea that there's not enough memory to store all the data. All the data. So by default, things go in and out of files uh, as intermediate points. If you don't have that problem and you can do streaming mode, then that's available. And there are lots of optimizations one could do in streaming mode as well. And so we look, we're also looking at things like using the file system, the MPI file system, uh, as another way of trying to reduce the amount of, inter, uh, of these uh, interim storage uh, penalties that you pay. So, okay, so that, that sort of begs the question then is, well, what about running MPI with this? Uh, 
One of the issues you run into when you try to run MPI is that uh, MPI requires that all the processes uh, in the job be running at the same time. Now remember I said earlier that the mappers and the reducers are run as separate jobs as far as the, uh, the computing uh, ORTE is concerned. They are different entities, separate entities. So, um, so the mappers and the reducers therefore can be treated separately in terms of MPI. Right? You may not be able to run mappers all at one time, so they can't run as an MPI job, but all the reducers might be able to run at one time, and therefore the reducers could be an MPI job. Uh, and if you look in the community, there's not a lot of interest really in, in mappers necessarily running MPI. There are some optimizations you could do in terms of the shuffle, the movement of data between these two, if this guy was also MPI. But, but the majority of interest is in having this phase be able to do MPI. Because if you can use MPI in the reducer phase, you can use machine learning tools, machine, uh, the current machine learning libraries in the reducer phase. And that's attractive. Uh, but the machine learning libraries, by and large, are MPI based uh, for performance reasons. So, uh, so what we've done in MR Plus is we automatically detect if all of the mappers or all of the reducers are going to be able to run at the same time. And if they are able to run at the same time, then we will allow them to run as MPI, uh, as an MPI job. So uh, that we're at the moment, we don't automatically make them be an MPI job, if they, even if it could be MPI, because there are certain reliability uh, uh, implications to that statement. But we, uh, we allow the user to, just to, to, to state that if you can run me as MPI, then go ahead and run me as MPI. That's a flag we're adding at this time. So the key here is that because we're running this in the uh, Orte Open MPI uh, code base as the platform underneath it, that MPI support is always available. We can do this anytime. Uh, we just have to be able to, to know when we are in a situation where all the mappers or all the reducers can be run at the same time. Uh, obviously, one of the, the things that Hadoop prides itself on is, is that, like I said, it has a very simple fault recovery model. There's no, uh, there's no communications, so there's no message in flight issues. It's basically a question of if a process dies, you simply restart it. Um, in, uh, in terms of performance, uh, because of the fact that you have to wait for a heartbeat to come back, it can take several seconds for a Hadoop system to be able to restart a process. Uh, on the other hand, because of the way uh, the high performance computing world treats faults, we can detect and restart a process in about five milliseconds. And that includes relocating it onto a different node. So uh, it's much, much faster to restart a process in this environment. One of the issues with restarting across a, a, a process, I mean, the reason MPI world doesn't do that so often is because we have a message in flight issue and a collective issue. If a process dies and restarts uh, in MPI world, there's a global state issue that has to be resolved. And so that's a very difficult problem. It's been studied for quite a number of years. Um, and there is no uh, silver bullet solution to that. So restarting a, a serial process, a non-MPI process, we can do very fast. Um, we don't normally use it that much simply because in the MPI world, uh, you have this global state issue. But in the Hadoop world, that's not an issue unless you're running MPI. And so therefore, um, Starting it, restarting it in a few milliseconds is something we can do. When we do relocate a process somewhere else in the uh, MPI world, the HPC world, we tend to relocate it um, in an, a non-random location. Uh, what we don't want to do is, you know, if you look at a, at a, at a rack, uh, a server rack, if if a particular node fails in that server rack there's a reasonably high probability that the guy right next to him is going to fail next. 
Why is that? Because most of the failure modes are because of temperature, of heat. And if this guy's running hot, the next guy's probably getting pretty hot already too. So what you don't want to do is take a process that failed on one node and then immediately stick them on another node and have it fail out from under them again. So in the in the uh, in Orte, we have a relocation uh, mechanism that looks at the relative fault probabilities of the of the of the nodes. So we actually look at where the failure occurred. We look at what boards, what what uh, what nodes are around that, which have common power supplies, where which are on sitting in a common rack, etc. And we, when we restart the process, we start it in a location where there's a resource available, but it's not on a common failure platform, or at least the probability of a common failure is low. So that way, we try and avoid cascading failures. So that we, you know, like I said, we, we have a process fail because of, of a node failure, and then you put it somewhere and have that node fail, and you have to restart it yet again. So those are some of the, the, the the fault uh, recovery methods that we'd like to take advantage of. Some of the other things we have, for example, that we have in, in Orte today is the ability to create bookmarks, uh, for example, where you can actually, uh, the application has a, an API where you can actually tell us where you are and say, uh, save this bookmark for me. Now that bookmark is something that has to be meaningful to you. It could be a location in a file, it could be anything. Um, but when we restart you, we we make whatever bookmark you gave us, we always return to you. So when you start back up, the application can call and ask, do I have a bookmark waiting for me? And if you do, you can use that as a recovery mechanism. So those kind of things we're going to try and make available over time. So why would someone might, might want to use this? Well, for one thing, uh, Customers decide what resource managers, what environments they want to support on their clusters for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, it can be historical. It can be because uh, you know, my, my IT staff knows how to manage a particular environment. Uh, it could be because there's a business relationship already established. So there's a lot of reasons why someone might pick Slurm versus LSF for Grid Engine or whatever. Um, and you don't really want to be, as a software uh, provider, in the business of telling your customer you have to use a particular environment if you want to run my application. So, so the flexibility that you get by, by using this abstraction and getting away from the requirement that you have to run the Hadoop resource manager on it uh, is, is something that might, might be a reason for somebody to go this way. If you're going to run large jobs, uh, jobs that are more than like a, a hundred processes or so in size, then the scalability might be a factor that you consider. Like I said, you know, launch scalability and wire up scalability in, in Hadoop is quite a bit different than it is in the high performance computing world. So as a result, your performance can tend to be better. Um, you can launch certainly a great deal faster at scale than you can. And there's some potential speed ups in performance as well when you start changing the messaging system and if you start taking advantage of some of the MPI uh, capabilities. So bottom line there is that you might actually be able to get to a stage where you can think of the idea of running a Hadoop query, a MapReduce query actually interactively instead of as a batch job. Maybe you can make it run that fast. And then you get access to the various MPI libraries out there that people have developed over the years for things like machine learning. So some of the things we've been able, we've benchmarked, these are kind of preliminary numbers because uh, there's a lot of optimization that we have not, that is not reflected in these numbers yet. But you can see the, the, these bluish lines over here are the, are the MR plus lines, these Greenish lines are the Hadoop lines. This is a benchmark running on Hive, which is one of the Hadoop <coughs> applications. It's not MapReduce, but it's basically a Hadoop SQL uh, lookup doing various, various types of queries in this particular benchmark. And you can see that there's, depending upon the query, uh, there's, there's, there's significant difference. In some queries, there's not as much difference. So why that, that, why aren't they all more uniform? And the reason is simple, that is, 
This is probably a query that involves a lot of computation. And if you have a lot of computation, if you think of it, we haven't changed the computation engine in Hadoop. We just changed the resource manager part. So if you launch, you read some data, and then you just sit there and churn for a while to do a computation, you're not going to see a lot of difference between the two because the computation engine is the same. On the other hand, if you're doing a lot of launching and, and, uh, and, uh, and shuffling and doing several map reduce stages, you're going to see more change, more of a difference. So this is at a slightly different data size. I double the data size. This is 100 gigabytes instead of 50 gigabytes. And you can see that some of those ratios have changed. But what type of system did you run this on? This is running on just a, a, a commodity Intel cluster. We're using just Ethernet. And so this is, you can see here again now, the data is now getting very large, getting 256 gigabytes of data. And you see these numbers are starting to, are starting to uh, approach each other more because you're spending more time in computation. If we look at other benchmarks that are sort of the typical ones that people run, uh, uh, histogram uh, benchmarks, a word count benchmark, et cetera, you can see that the performance in these cases is not scaling as well as we'd like. Uh, there's obviously optimization that needs to be improved on. A lot of this is because we know we have a, a, a bottleneck in the shuffle process in MapReduce that needs to be cleaned up, and we are hoping to have that cleaned up here fairly soon. But, uh, but the point is that you can see that you're really not paying any penalty for gaining the flexibility to run this anywhere. And I think when we get these optimizations in place, we'll actually be able to show that there's actually performance enhancement. So what do we learn from doing this, this port? Well, first off, there's certainly no reason why you can't run MapReduce anywhere. Uh, it's, it's, it, uh, it's, it certainly works under Orte. It certainly talks to various resource managers. I've run it on Slurm machines. We've run it on RSH machines. I've actually put it on a Cray at one of the national labs and run it. And it seems to all run, run just fine in those various locations. Um, so you can certainly get performance out of it. You can execute it anywhere. You get access to the MPI. Uh, as I noted earlier, you do see a performance benefit, uh, a reduction in performance benefit as the computation load increases. But that's to be expected because we didn't make any change to the computation engine. This is the big bottleneck right now, is in moving the data between the mappers and the reducers. And we are looking at different ways of doing that uh, to improve that, that performance. We know we have already identified one bottleneck that we hopefully cleared out here this week. So I'm expecting these numbers to improve dramatically over the next uh, uh, short period of time. And then, Right now, we don't allow mappers and reducers to, to overlap. You run all the mappers, and then you run all the reducers. Well, if you look at that, you're wasting some time, because when the mappers are get, finishing up, uh, there's a set of resources that frees up as the mappers drain that you're not using for a period of time until the final mapper completes. And there's no reason to do that. So uh, there's some overlap that we can do that will certainly improve things. So where are we going from here? Um, we're going to complete the port. Uh, right now, we are running under Hadoop 1.0. Uh, we've done a little bit of work towards porting it to Hadoop 2.0, and so we're going to have to finish that up. Uh, we're going to check out the, uh, the rest of the Hadoop tool, tools and validate them. Obviously, there's a lot more testing and benchmarking to do. We certainly want to look at some larger scale demonstrations. This has all been done on fairly small scale. Um, to, to date, but we want to get to bigger scales. And we're probably uh, very shortly here going to do an alpha release of the code to early adopters to let them start getting some, some, uh, some uh, hands-on experience with it. We can start getting some feedback on it. Uh, we're certainly going to keep pushing this. We know, like I said, we have a bottleneck in the shuffle that we think we've cleared out. Uh, but we are going to continue working on that. And there's a bunch of other operations that we think we can make uh, more, a little more parallel, a little more efficient. And then out of all that, 
uh, this is an open source effort and so we're going to be looking at what the right kind of community is for it but basically something that supports um, this approach going forward. Now the code currently sits mostly over in the open MPI side of things which has its own community to support it. Um, the map reduce parts of this uh, we're going to look at putting that back into the Hadoop community uh, but uh, either way if we can't get it back into the Hadoop community, then we will look at, at perhaps having a different community that supports it. But that's all to be determined. Ideally, it will move back over into the Hadoop community. That's the end of my talk. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to address them if you didn't address them during the course of the talk. Yeah, I have more questions. So most of the code, like the jogplant.c and mapred and film file system.c, those are in OMPI OMP right now in Part 4D, or is that the separate piece the, that's in, in this MR plus? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the question was, what about those Gini modules? Where are they? Uh, they are not in the Open MPI trunk. They are actually in the Hadoop trunk, if you will, our branch of the Hadoop trunk. And that's the part that I was talking about that we would like to push back into the Hadoop world at some point if they'll accept them. And so that would be Apache license and all that That stuff. is Apache license. Okay, and then the part that would stay in Orti would be BSD. That's all the OMPI license, which is a BSD-like license. Yeah, that's already all out in the OMPI trunk right now. Okay. Everything's there. Uh, the only thing that is not, uh, that, that you know, you'd have to download separately is the uh, the Hadoop branch that has those that G, those Gini modules in it. And would the plan be that this would be just fit into this whole ecosystem that Green Plum has for you know the, the structured data package and the ability to move problems between like the unstructured this kind of MR and uh, HD package and everything that y'all have. I mean, wh where would it end up going into? The stuff you see on the web page, that's what I'm asking. The question is, where does this fit into the Green Plum product family? Yes. Uh, how's that? How's it all go together? It's going to be packaged as part of the uh, Green Plum Hadoop distribution eventually. Okay. okay. So there will be a a system that allows you to run the, the, all those tools anywhere, not just on a on a yarn cluster. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.